Um, I forgot. All right. <laughs> Hi, and we're live. Um, <laughs> hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Art Share. I'm your host, Bridget Ashwood. Uh, my website's BridgetAshwood.com. I'm an artist and a writer. And don't forget to check out our art-share.org website, the website for our podcast. And remember that you can ask us questions there at any time, including during the show. This week, we have three writers with us. We're going to go ahead and start with Nimue, have her introduce herself. Hello, I'm Nimoy Brown. I am fantastically sleep deprived, so I may be less than perfectly articulate this week. I write books on druidry. I write gothic fiction, including graphic novels, with my other half, Tom Brown. That will be Hopeless Main, which you can find at hopelessmain.com. Um, I'm all over the internet like some kind of disease. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Megan? I'm Megan Congdon. I'm currently working on my first book. And you can read my blog at mythoshi.livejournal.com. Awesome. That's it. Karina? <laughs> um, I'm Karina Lawson. Uh, my website is karina-lawson.com. And if you go there, it'll say writer, mom, geek, and superhero. And I like to say that I'm all for those, but not often all on the same day. <laughs> I'm not feeling very superhero-y today. Um, I've written uh, six published novels, uh, a couple of comic book short stories, and I'm the content director for geekmom.com. And I, I'm, I'm hyped up on BC peanut butter cup uh, pumpkins, actually, because they were left over. They were left over, and I bought a whole Ooh. stack of, of them. So I'm wide awake now. I think we've all got our poisons this morning, right? <laughs> Um, all right, let's see. Oh, and I can't forget this month's sponsor because uh, our theme this month is writing, and our sponsor this month is geekygodmother.com. Uh, Leanne Faruga, hope, we were just talking about pronouncing names. Hopefully I pronounced her name properly, but she's your geeky godmother. She does all kinds of things, like she can help people organize and um, promote projects, plan events, but uh, particularly relevant to this month's theme, she also does book editing. So check out geekygodmother.com. All right, so... This week, uh, and I, I guess we, we probably, like, the controversial topic of the month, I don't know, I think maybe we'll sort of, like, weave around that, right? But it's bound to always, you know, uh, it brings up so many other issues of just advice and how to go about, you know, achieving your dreams and, and uh, what can... Um, what can inspire and spur people on, what works for some writers and what doesn't. And so I'm curious, what is the best advice everybody's received? But then we're going to also cover the worst advice. What things work for you and what things haven't? Who wants to go first? Anybody? I think the best advice I had, or certainly the most life-changing advice, was one of my tutors at college who said, seriously, if you want to write fiction, get out of academia. It will kill you as an author. Mm -hmm. And I'd been umming and iron over which way to go. And I thought, okay, fine, I trust this guy, actually, and I'm not sure, so bugger it, I'll quit. Um, <laughs> and, and here I am, not being an academic. So, yeah, it was a bit of a life changer for me. I don't know if he was right, because I have no idea what would have happened if I'd gone the other way. But um, That's you. funny, because I was just reading, uh, doing research for today's show, I read uh, William Faulkner said the same thing. I bet that's where he got it from, you know. <laughs> actually, on that subject... Uh, the advice I got was from a writer who did get out of academia. Um, Jen Jenny Cruzy was is a all but dissertation PhD in literature um, from Ohio State, and her dissertation was going to be on romance novels and feminism. And she read a whole bunch of romance novels and loved them and started writing them. And that's <laughs> she's not, and she got out of academia. Um, she taught me about plotting, which is basically trouble is not a plot. Uh, things happening is not a plot. A plot is actual conflict. But um, I have. To... Oh, we just lost her. <laughs> Shoot! It always happens right in the middle of something fascinating, doesn't it? Let me uh, invite her back real quick. How about you, Megan? Um. Well, we addressed this before. I haven't because I've never really been that public about my writing before. It's not something that I've discussed with you know, aside from just like class assignments when I was in high school and I guess the only advice I really got from that was teachers telling me not to be afraid to think that my own writing was good because I, it's never as good as I want it to be and I would be really disparaging of my own work and they would tell me that, you know, you should 
be proud of your writing and if in it, no one else will. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, once it gets out there, if you don't have confidence in it yourself, then why is anybody else going to care? So, yeah, striking that's about that it, balance. you know. Yeah, I think striking that balance can be can be tough because we can, you have to silence your inner critic when it's holding you back, but then you have to listen if you want to grow. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's, so that's it. <laughs> finding that is uh, is really I'm, a challenge. Of the being outside. critical is much easier. Yeah. It's easier for you? Yeah. yeah. And there will be no shortage of external critics, and some of them will be really <laughs> helpful, and some of them will be full of poo and need ignoring, and working out <laughs> which of them to trust and which of them to wave fingers at and walk away from. That takes a bit of doing, too, because you know you let the wrong ones in, etc. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think... Um, Again, in researching this morning, I was going through a whole bunch of quotes, and I loved Neil Gaiman, what he had to say, which is that when people tell you that there's something wrong, that there's something not working for them, <clears throat> believe them because they're right, but that they're not right about what exactly is wrong. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> I was trying to think about, like, the, the best advice I got, and I, I don't know. I think, you know, to, to kind of... Over the course of it, that's that's too too vast for me to pick something else. But but I think recently, what's been really helpful to me is um, I read a ton, and I'm I'm just a reading reading junkie. I mean, I can't stop myself from like reading the back of the shampoo bottle in the shower. I mean, it's just compulsive anyway. But um, so anytime there's like free self help books or or things go on sale on Amazon, I picked up um, two thousand to ten thousand words by Rachel Aaron. And I have to say, I wrote her uh, an email thanking her for writing that book because I really expected it to just be a rehash of everything else that I've ever read. And it wasn't. It was short. It was to the point. She didn't try to um, drag things out just to, to make the content seem you know, longer for the, for the price of the book. And the thing that really struck me that she said is that if you're avoiding writing, that there's something wrong with your story. And I think as a – I'm not new to writing, but I'm new to writing fiction. Um, and I, that clicked for me. I mean, it may sound basic, but that clicked for me because I have a history of procrastination anyway. I just assumed it was the usual laziness, but that really made sense. And when I took, took a look at what it was that I was avoiding writing and realized where the problems were and, you know, what was boring me and, and uh, understanding that, you know, you don't need to write it if it's boring. You can change it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. To me, that that seemed like maybe it seems like an obvious tip, but I thought that was it. Yeah, was good. Hit me the right way at the right time, you know. That point about you read everything, though, I think that's really important. That there are people, and I've run into them, who will say, "Oh, I don't have time to read. I'm too busy writing." That's rubbish. If you don't read, how can you possibly write? If you don't love books, yeah. how can you write? And and read everything you can get your hands on, and read the rubbish, and work out why you don't like it. Absolutely, and, and read the great stuff, and try and work out why it was so popular. And think, don't don't just read the books, but but ponder about what makes them tick. Absolutely. What makes them what makes them engaging, what makes them exciting, because once you get that, you can steal it, and then you're in business, and it saves you having to work out from scratch. Absolutely. Novels are slow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you've got to learn it by writing novels, it's going to take you a bloody long time, whereas if you can read a lot of novels and read bigger things out, you save a lot of work. You save a lot of work. Yeah, that's why all, all of the, uh, you know, 30 years I've had leading up to starting to work on my first book has been Research, <laughs> you know. All the, I mean, I'm constantly reading fiction and nonfiction all the time. So, mm. you know, file all that away, and then you can, like you said, steal it. You know, yeah. reconstitute it, and hope no one notices. But you also <laughs> know do what it well has enough. Been done, so you won't just yeah. blithely go off and do something that's painfully obvious because you've already read those and you know what's out there. And that really yeah. helps. And that, well, you know. Right, because everything, it's being, you know, I, I've seen so many people get discouraged at the idea that there's, you know, there's no original ideas anymore, there's nothing new under the sun, but what's original yeah. is new, you know? There's I mean, only like five stories altogether. Right. You know, well. when you break them down, well, yeah, but there are a million different ways to tell them, so. Right. 
It's yeah. only although I have I have simplified a... things. It's white now. If you if yeah. you take all the nuance and the detail and the interest out of it, sure you can reduce it down to a handful of things. But well, uh, I mean, I've cool. I've got a, like a heavy Joseph Campbell bias. I mean, ah, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean that 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 goes back to me being parked in front of public television since I was, you know, not big enough to walk. So. <laughs> uh, is a heavy influence on the way I think about these things. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but even, I guess, you know, I guess, you know, got that wretched echo again. Sorry, I always get distracted by that. Um, but I guess the thing is, is that just because when you're working hard on something and, and you come across something similar on the internet that you had no idea over, I mean, that can be really devastating to people, but I don't think it's a reason to not continue with what you work. You can use it as a challenge to see, you know, maybe where you can change whatever you're working on to make it more original, but I do think I, it's all about perception. And, sorry, I, I, the echo really gets in me. Somebody else talk. Somebody else talk. <laughs> Ooh. We, we lost you, Corinna. You want to finish your thought? Up, oh, where you're muted. All right. There, there we, we go. go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Today's art share is brought to you by Gremlins. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, you were talking about encouraging writers, it sounded like. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, I don't know. I remember getting a uh, talk at uh, Romance Writers of America conference um, from a lovely writer named Barbara Samuel, and she was talking about, and it's one of the more encouraging organizations uh, for mentoring young writers, and she was talking about how we lose so many writers because so many other things call uh, family and jobs and everything, and um, that we need to cherish um, those who want to try and write mm -hmm. as much as possible, even if they only have one book in them. They only have one book in them. That's a nice thought. Yeah, I think. Um, I think. Um, <laughs> moving on to the worst advice. Moving on to the worst <laughs> advice. Mm. <laughs> Anybody have not any directed advice? to me, but I am seeing online, particularly because of the seasonal aspect. <clears throat> People talking about it's fine to suck. It's absolutely fine to write a big pile of useless rubbish that you maybe will edit into something later. It's practice. It's okay. It's a good thing. And I think that is the most dreadful advice imaginable. It's fine to make mistakes. It's fine to make mistakes. Mistakes are great. We all learn from those. But to be mediocre, to do something that sucks, to be to be doing something that's worthless, that you know is worthless. What on earth does that do to somebody to think that that's okay? To think that that's okay. If you're not aspiring, if you're not dreaming big, why the hell are you writing a book in the first place? You know? And if you're not imagining that you could do the best that you could possibly do this time, why are you writing a book? And I think permission to suck is, is just something that needs something to be over the head with a large rock because it's a large rock thing. <laughs> permission to be brilliant. Permission to be gobsmackingly, stunningly beautiful. <laughs> And maybe make some mistakes, sure, but, but no sucking. Nobody should no sucking. go in expecting to suck. That sucks. Well, I, I disagree. Well, I, I, I think it depends on your writing process. Um, I know my first draft is going to suck. I know it takes me four or five drafts to get it to be very, very good. And if I expected the very first words I put on the page um, to be perfect or to be brilliant, um, I would never finish a book. What I have learned for me is that I have to give myself, yeah, this is going to be bad the first time. It's sort of like painting, you know. You, 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 nobody expects a painter um, to just be Rembrandt without any practice at all. And yet the formal process of writing, we don't have a, um, and hopefully you guys can still hear me because I just glitched here. Um, you have to practice, and you have to practice any craft. And oh, so, so I think we lose a lot of young writers by telling them it has to be brilliant the minute you put it on. So can you guys hear me? No, Grandma? yes, we can hear you. Um, no, you, we can okay. hear you fine. You can hear me. 
Yes, <laughs> we can hear you. Can you hear us? <laughs> I, I would agree that encouraging people to feel that they have to be brilliant from the get-go is equally ridiculous because yes, any craft you have to learn, you have to study, you have to practice. But that's not the same as saying it's okay to suck. Um, that you have to work at it absolutely, that you have that, that things will progress, that you won't be as good the first time as you will be the second time. Well, that's logical and reasonable. But the whole logic of um, good enough without making an effort, I suppose, is something that I keep seeing online at the moment. And, and the comfortableness with mediocrity. Now, if you're taking the first draft and polishing the hell out of it such that it becomes this work of beauty and sculpting it into something fantastic, great. No problem. No argument from me. But, but being comfortable with it not being very good, I think, eh, I'm, not, I'm not so keen on that as a, as a thought form. I, d I, if I, I think it's the striving that is the making of us. If I can as jump, if we're not striving, you're missing something. Right. I actually think it could be just all boil down to semantics or just interpretation of what that means. Because I think I see people saying that and I get a very different perception of what they mean. So mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't see anybody really meaning that it's okay, you know, to, to live a, a creative life. Um, striving for <clears throat> mediocrity or for failure. That, that's not what I see. What, what I feel like they're saying, I mean, and, and we're seeing the same things, I just have a different interpretation. Mm. I feel like what they're saying is it's okay to be in my process. It's okay that I'm not at the end of my journey and I haven't reached perfection and I'm continuing to go on because at every stage we're, we're constantly changing. We're never the same artist from one second to the next. And so we look back on our body of work and something that I liked 10 minutes ago, in 20 minutes from then, I'll have evolved so far that I can see the flaws that I, that I couldn't even see before. And <clears throat> I think I interpret when they're saying that, and, and like I said, it's, you know, it's not right or wrong, it's everybody's perception, but I, I'm not interpreting it the same way as they really think it's okay um, to suck. I think what they're saying is that it's okay to not be perfect now. Um, I, I'm sure there probably are some people who really do mean that. <laughs> okay, I've but, seen some but very those people aren't going to go anywhere. So I don't think we even need to. Yeah. Work. But but like well, for me, when I say that, and and it's funny, I, I've quoted my mother on this show, and my mom's actually here this week, and we were talking about this the other day. Is my mom? Um, but it's such a very personal thing because she knew me so well growing up and what a perfectionist myself and my brother are and how impossibly hard we were on ourselves. And she had this very flip saying that she really didn't mean, but she, she said it because it, um, it got a reaction. And she said, there's a lot of room for mediocrity. <laughs> but that was at once um, consolation and a challenge, if you understand what she meant by that. Like, okay, so you're not where you want to be yet. You're not perfect yet. But that's okay. You still have a right to create. The universe still gives you permission. It's inherent in you to be a creative person and be an artist. But yet, at the same time, don't you want to be even more than that and continue challenging yourself? So I think I just... I can see why that would, would bother you, but I think I, I, I feel like when I'm reading it that that's just what people are saying. Maybe they're like me and that perfectionist who would never do anything if they couldn't silence that inner critic. Yeah. And that's got to be true of some people, definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. um, I'm really fussy about language and the use of language and the nuance of words and the precise meanings. I'm driven round the bend by people who will come and blithely infer things that I did not say mm -hmm. and then have a go at me for having said them. I've had a lot of that in the last few weeks. It's like, no, you're inferring. I did not say that. And then they go rant, rant, rant. And then on the, the other hand, people who say things that they do not mean. Mm. And then because they didn't mean them, you're not supposed to have taken it that way. You're supposed to magically know. We have language for a reason, and it's for communicating. And if you're using it in such a shoddy way that it doesn't communicate what you meant, that's a problem. Now, if you're talking about process, this is my process, this is what I do, this is how I work, fine. You know what you're talking about. Permission to suck. I mean, I got a blog earlier today. Somebody sent me a link to something that basically said, give yourself permission to suck. And I just wanted to scream at them because that's not clever. And that is, that is a very clear statement. When you say permission to suck, it's not ambiguous. It doesn't have 
vague, woolly, uncertain meanings. It has a very, very clear and definite meaning. And if you want to interpret that loosely, you're doing a thing. You're taking those words and you're making them do something that you're more comfortable with. And I think this is the kind of stuff that you need to think about. Also, if you're writing books, what are you asking people to infer? What are you implying? Are you speaking plainly? There's a big um, writing issue here. And I can definitely say that. You know. <laughs> certainly, certainly revolving around the discussion of writers, it, it, it is that mm. much more intense because, yeah. yes, <laughs> you know, the meaning should be clear or else, yes. you know, what is Or if they're about? not, you should hold them as that. You know, if you mean yes. to be ambiguous, be ambiguous, sure, but, right. you know, it's... <laughs> right, right. Perhaps there'd be a little more leeway if it was, you know, a yeah. frozen yogurt, <laughs> frozen yogurt convention of, of people that run frozen yogurt shops or something. I mean, I don't know why I pulled that out of my head. Maybe I should get frozen yogurt later. But, but yes, we're talking <laughs> about writing, um, which, you know, is rather precise. Yeah. Um, How we use language is so important, and and it's it's a tool and a medium, and and not something to just sort of fling around randomly. If you want to get precise effects, right. So it troubles me when people involved in writing projects are out there just flinging the right, the words around in any way that occurs to them, and then you know that there's no coherence. I suppose is the word I'm looking for. Um, between what is said and what is meant and what is interpreted, and it's it's like trying to talk to people in three different languages at the same time. Mm -hmm. What? Okay. Why did all the words change their meanings, and why did nobody tell me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what. So we got Megan back. You here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think it's there's. Okay. Like some network trouble today because we keep losing mm. and it's like well we'll see how it goes um, but yeah that's uh, it's it's definitely a very it's brought up a lot of, of heated emotions hasn't it and you know mm. it's interesting to see um, the different philosophies and um, shoot I had a, a thought just fly out of my mind that I was going to share but in the meantime actually I was thinking about something I was trying to think about the writing tips that I hate um, the, you know, you always get the beginning writer's tips. Five tips for new writers and blah, 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 blah. Um, and also, I wish that they would say, and some of them do, but for fiction writers, because really, most of them, they're, they're addressing themselves to fiction writers, not to journalists or bloggers. Um, but the show don't tell. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I hate that so very much. And Megan and I have had long conversations because we have very similar... Um, <laughs> Uh, influences and reading pleasures and uh, you know I was thinking God if they'd ever told that to Jane Austen <laughs> I, she'd never have written a book I mean she tells you the nuts and bolts of conversations that happen you know off scene that are even you know pretty relevant to the plot but you know she never even shows you that and just tells you what it is and um, you know rather succinctly um, additionally you know it's storyteller, not story shower. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I've really struggled to understand what that even means for the longest time. And in I practical terms, what it means is very long, boring, irrelevant scenes that pad the bloody word count. <laughs> and and far too much yes. time spent eating things. Yes. <laughs> I agree. And you know what? Um, I, I, the best I could find online, and correct me if anybody knows better, but I was trying to find the origins of it, and it, somebody had said that it came from a, a letter that Chekhov wrote in which he said, don't tell me the moon is shining, show me the glint of light on broken glass. Yes, lovely. <laughs> and I, and that's, that's lovely, and I get what he's saying. He's talking mm. about immersion, creating an environment, painting a picture, setting a scene, summoning a mood, you know, bringing your reader into... The story with you, and I. But then, even further, to to get me to understand this, like on a gut level, I translated it into. I mean, this wasn't. I didn't engineer this. It was just kind of a little epiphany. But I was thinking about people. You know, when you meet someone and they tell you who they are, they tell you what they're like, and you've known them maybe for a few months or a few, you know, few years or something, and you realize that. 
they've only ever told you who they are and what you know of them is so completely contrary to everything that they've told you about who they are like I'm a nice guy or I'm really generous or I'm really open-minded and you know them by their actions and the content of their character to be completely different from that so when <laughs> I thought of that I thought okay then as a writer maybe that's what they mean by show don't tell don't dictate to your reader I'm writing an excellent story full of thought-provoking topics and inherent conflict that is really deep and meaningful and my you know the relationship between my two main characters is really compelling um, no you actually have to deliver it you can't just tell them you know what the basis of it. Um, sorry and, and actually I found just this morning I, I despised it because I found a blog again trying to explain show don't tell and I, I None of them explain it very well because it's bullshit. So, you know, they're sitting there. <laughs> they, they stumble around trying to explain it. And the line in this one is, is they said, um, they said, for instance, this is telling. Mr. Baker was a fat, ungrateful man. And, I, and they're like, see how bad that is? And I said, I love that line, actually. <laughs> I so much I the huh? I was going to say, so much hangs on the context. If Mr. Baker is your main character, maybe that's not the best way to do it unless it's like right at the beginning mm -hmm. um, if Mr. Baker is a bit part who's going past in a couple of pages you haven't got time to lavishly develop him he just needs chucking in so that people know what the important points of reference are and you get on with it so it's most of it is about context right. and showing the important bits of the story and the action and the dialogue where the things are happening yeah that's fantastic we want those mm -hmm. telling me the intimate details of the lunch no no, I, I, you know. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, I, don't care. <laughs> I, I, but I was thinking my reaction to that, and I, I'm very well read, uh, and I like to think I have relatively good taste. Um, but my reaction was, I love that line. If that was the opening yeah. line of a book, yeah, I would yeah, love yeah, that yeah, line. I would right. keep reading. That. I think you know what a lot of this I think comes down to is just the. Uh, People you used to read a book from. The what? Because again, 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 we lost you. Say the again. time period, like ah. the, the the literary period that someone is used to. Because show don't tell does not work with nineteenth century fiction. <laughs> it's like the opposite of that. And if people are basing their advice for someone writing a book now on you know mid to late 20th century because it's or in your writing it doesn't always apply so you know it to me personally I don't I don't pay any attention to it but <laughs> you know I it, it can be it, you know in the right circumstances in the right circumstances. It's, it's to, and making any rule universal is always a mistake. <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, because everyone writes differently, and I don't know. It's irritating. I, I don't read those kind of blogs. I hate anybody trying to tell me how to do something that I'm fairly confident I already have a handle on, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, I feel like if that works for you, great, but don't try to impose it on everyone around you because you want them to write the same way you do because that's totally ridiculous. Agreed, because there's different kinds of writers and there's different kinds of readers, and I'm the reader that the minute you start describing clothing to me or the, the dinner that they're eating or too much of the house that they're living, I don't give a crap. I skip straight to the dialogue. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Hi again. Oh, Sorry. No. I, Hi, Karina. Sorry. Me. Technical issues. No. Uh, you know, you were talking about that. Um, I started reading George R. R. Martin because mm -hmm. of the TV show. Mm -hmm. And the first hundred pages of Game of Thrones is like, oh my god, how many pages are devoted to Bran climbing around Winterfell? I mean, like tens. I, I would have put the book down if I hadn't watched the TV show. So I, I love the books now, but I skip like 
massive chunks of food and clothing and you, you know, could argue and that stuff. there are large portions of Tolkien that could possibly be skimmed. <laughs> I mean, I I adore Tolkien, but, but how many pages of people walking do you really need? Yes, you know. Not that many. <laughs> <laughs> Heresy. <laughs> Oh no, yeah. I already had, you know, I've already had people try to take my geek card away when I admit that I, I got through The Hobbit and nothing else because I don't care who beget what. I mean, yeah. long lists. <laughs> if I went, and what was the? And again, we've all got the the brain damage today because of lack of sleep and lack of tea. But okay, it was the Eddas, right? He based them. He was inspired by the Eddas. That sounds like lots of. Well, the thing that cracks me up about Tolkien was that he thought that Shakespeare was too modern. Was Shakespeare was he what? He did not think people too modern. Oh. Too he was too recent a writer to be relevant. <laughs> he was interested in Northern <laughs> European mythology and Catholicism, and that's where his entire mythos was based off of. Yeah. So, which is fine, but... Telling people they shouldn't read Shakespeare because, I mean, I don't know. I do think, though, sometimes whatever age you read something has an impact because um, I read Tolkien when I was 13, and I can tell you I still have the entire genealogy of the Noldar memorized. I know where Galadreo is on the family tree. <laughs> um, I can Pretty tell you small. at one point I had all the hobbits genealogy memorized, and I can tell you how Bilbo and Frodo were related, uh, but I was 13, and you know, I think I've gotten to be much more ADD reader um, as time has gone on. Yeah, I can relate uh, to that. Um, but that also just goes to show, too, because there's plenty of people who read him later in life, and they, they love all of that, and again, you know, there's different writers for different readers, and that's great. Love yeah. it. <laughs> I have a mood for it. You know, I love reading. It, it appeals to, uh, you know, I love mythology from all different cultures. I think a few Indian significant cultures the Silmarillion, but the rest of the time it's like, I can't concentrate on this now. Give me, you know, a Mercedes Lackey novel that doesn't require that much concentration. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with Mercedes Lackey. I love her books, but I can read them in eight hours if I have nothing else to do. So. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good segue for us into we want to talk about uh, two of the published authors we have with us today and their their current works that they have out. You have new stuff. Nimue, let's start with you. Dude, this is crazy month for me. I've only had quite a long quiet period the world has now gone mad so out I think tomorrow is spirituality without structure which does not have the best cover because it isn't a Tom Brown cover it's a, I know I, I was robbed um, it's a pagan portal so it's a tiny little book it's 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 really skinny um, but there's a whole series that moon books do of pagan portals that give people sort of little books that they can access ideas about paganism, very focused, not your kind of bland 101, everything you already knew about witchcraft rehash. These are, there's some great titles in the series. I'm Joe van der Hoeven's Zen Druidry. Is, so there's all kinds of exciting stuff out there. And I, I've got one. Um, I've just unplugged Tom's computer because I'm clever. So <laughs> one is out tomorrow, I think, it's on Amazon. What have I done? Ah, right hole. Okay, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> and then on, nobody seems to quite know which date, but at some point, November 13th. I think it's the seventh. I pre-ordered it. I think Focus it said the May. seventh. Ooh, Focus May Ooh. book two. Book two will be coming, which we are desperately excited about. I I love the colours in this one. It's not quite as dark as the first. Oh, gorgeous. Um. So it's come out. It's come out really well. Those of you who are watching by radio will not be able to see the pages that I'm holding up to the camera. <laughs> so you'll have to get there by other means. And don't show them that page. Don't show them that page. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just where we need to cue in. That make page. Lots of yummy noises. So ooh, mm. yummy. <laughs> I'm trying to figure yeah. out a way to describe the art style. It's sort of um, Becky Cloonan, sort of. 
Gothic <laughs> manga is where we normally yeah, go. Yeah, gothic manga, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. Becky Cloonan. What's a Becky Cloonan? So, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to Google it. Be um, Becky Cloonan? Uh, she's, a, she's an artist. Uh, that, that reminded her a little bit of her style. Oh, cool. Um, and, cool. Tom uh, and where can everybody get these books? Everywhere. It's um, anywhere that you can conceivably buy a book from, these books will be. And probably some places that they shouldn't. But, um, okay. Uh, but you don't have to have a, a preferable link for them to go to? Uh, not to hand, no. I mean, obviously, if you have a bookshop or a comic shop, in the case of Hopeless, you know, go in and, and give them your money because that's splendid and lovely. If you know us personally, you can get copies of us, but we're not kind of going very far out of Gloucestershire at the moment. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, Amazon book depository right. is usually cheaper than Amazon. Amazon, um, but we're very easy to find. Can you talk a bit about what Hopeless is about? Hopeless is set on a fictional island off the coast of Maine, which is, and Tom is from Maine originally, which is why we started there. Um, it's a very odd island. I don't want to explain it too much, but it's, it's like Victorian times-ish. It may have been then. Um, it may have other things going on. It's very creaturey. Um, it has a flora and fauna like nowhere else, resplendent with extra eyes and tentacles. Um, it has magic. It has some very strange folk, and the citizenry are frankly probably more closely related to each other than is good for them. And into the middle of this comes Salamandra, a child of uncertain parentage and uncertain history, and there's been some fantastic speculation about how she got to where she is. Um, but she's an odd girl and a bit of a misfit, even by hopeless standards. So it's it's very much a story about her getting to grips with the world, growing up, finding her place. It's it's about not quitting, I think, in essence. It's about not losing your dreams and your hopes in face of the bloody ridiculous. Is kind of the core essence of the story. But there's lots of other things going on around that. And dead people, so... <laughs> <laughs> we think if you can cope with Harry Potter, if you can cope with Doctor Who, you're probably fine. And if those things scare you witless, we're probably not a good bet. So children over the age of eight and lots of grown-ups, mostly. Except for the Sounds ones like don't. just typical New England to me. Tom says it is that way. Yes, that, that there's a reason all these, these mad and freaky things come out of New England. It's a I've spent a lot of time in Vermont, so... Right. Yes, <laughs> that. Grew up in Vermont. <laughs> Something, okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, absolutely. And I, I want to reassure our viewers that um, this is not, I mean, this is just one of the first times that we're going to be talking about Hopeless Maine, and we're going to spend quite a lot of more time talking about Hopeless Maine. Um, so I want to solicit questions now. This will be the first time that we'll mention it, because soon soon we'll have an episode devoted to Tom and Nimue and um, all things fantastic with their creative process. <laughs> so, was this a surprise to Tom? Because we just discussed this. <laughs> okay. So, surprise! <laughs> Get ready soon. He's not um, panicking in the background, so we're probably okay. That's because I didn't hear anything. That's because he didn't hear anything. That's all right. Then. I'll we're break gonna it to <laughs> We're going to give the fan base like enough time that they can really get their questions in and stuff, because I, I really want to do that. So, I think that that's going to be great. And give them time okay. to... You know, some of them time to get out there and get the next book as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's uh, Karuna. So tell us about your latest. Um, this book. I'll hold it up, and I don't know if you guys can see. Tell me. This this book is actually called Phoenix Legacy, and That's it's awesome. part of my superhero romance there series, um, which is available everywhere. Um, Karina Lawson, and there are links on my website if you Google me. Um, I started writing romance and everybody was doing paranormals and um, I vampires and werewolves are not my thing so I thought well but I could write superheroes because I'm a comic book geek and so I sort of created an X-Men like um, group of people and this particular book I should mention was written during National Novel Writing Month one year um, because my personal life was like exploding but I used Nano to compete against some friends, and I was like, oh my god, she got 5,000 words. I'm really competitive. I'm like, <laughs> ah, I'm going to stay up at 2 a.m. 2 a.m. and finish. And so I got 50,000 words. And of course, it, my process is the words come out, and then I refine them. So rather than, you know, 
So I like to say it's, it, it sucks, but what it really means is I get all these ideas and concepts on paper where I can then uh, sharpen them up. Oh. And so it took me another six months um, to get it um, the correct way. And going back to my uh, former uh, academia professor who told me to add conflict, the conflict in this one is um, kind of a big one. The hero is a very dark hero. He was raised very badly and beaten and abused as a child and then turned into a black ops CIA agent. So he blends. So he doesn't really have a personality. And uh, the major conflict with the heroine is someone he knew from childhood. And he, um, he killed her parents. So it's kind of a big romantic conflict to overcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he had a really, really good reason. <laughs> he did. I could give it away. If, if it um, he was protecting her because okay. she was the person he loved, and all they both. You have to buy the book for all this, though. <laughs> yes, you have to buy the book, and um, it is probably not for children eight to twelve because they. Um, he's a rather violent, uh, emotionless guy, and there's some a little bit of um, S and M. I guess, uh, with it, um, just because um, he's also, the paranormal part is that he's like Wolverine and that he's a self-healer. Um, and so he really can't feel anything unless he also feels pain. So pain is what gets him off. And so, you know, I had a lot of fun writing him. You were talking about hope. And here's this character who's been completely damaged by a lot of different things. And his one bond is with his foster daughter who's in a previous book which started off the series and he's trying to figure out um, now that he's immortal what kind of a life he's going to have and um, so I like to think it's a sort of a story about hope and being able to even at it's redemption it's a redemption story I love redemption stories so and the, the heroine is, is um, we, we used to well, we used kind of a comic book plot for her so but she's really cool too Oh, and there's a there's a car in there. I love it. It was my brother's car growing up. It's a '67 Dodge Charger, and I got to ride a car chase, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think we're going to wrap up a little bit early this week, guys. And uh, I think I know we've got some people uh, following the the podcast who are doing Nano. And so, just to final final thoughts on Nano, I wanted to share um, my word count this year is zero. Okay, because I don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I, I personally, I, I think Nano's great for, for the people who are doing it for the right reasons and have the yes. right perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it taught me a lot last year. But the things that, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for what it taught me, but it taught me very entry-level basic stuff. Um, just that, you know, I can pound out words a day and all right, great. Um, and I think it's a lot of fun. Like we were all saying, it's all about context and the perspective that you're in. And I know, what's your word count, Megan? I already know what it is. I'm what? I've been too busy getting ready for fairy con to write anything oh, all week. No, our word counts are zero, right? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I will join okay. in. Zero. 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 I'm doing edits, but right. and I'm plotting. But you know, it. You're right. It's the daily writing habit, and I have that, and so I don't exactly. need it. But exactly, and uh, you know, but uh, so everybody that that's doing it, just have fun. Don't get discouraged. Don't worry about you know. The first year I ever did Nano, I mean, I I quit you know a little bit in and for any number of variety of reasons, but I didn't let it kill the drive. Of course not. You know. I, mean, I think if you find it isn't working for you, yeah. assume the problem is the structure and mm -hmm. not you, because Absolutely. there's no one right way to write, and some of us need a damn sight more time than a month and can't crank it out, and that doesn't mean that you're a failure as a writer or a bad person or, or doomed in any way. It just right. means that man, I was a lousy structure for you personally. Go some other place, it'll be fine. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, and I, I think it, it, it does all boil down to um, your process and how you create, because I can relate to Corinna's process of needing a pile of words, mm -hmm. and, and that's what I do, but what I find is that every time I get down and crank out these pile of words, the, 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 the way that pile looks at the beginning 
gets better and better and better each time I create this new pile of words. It's more refined just throughout the process, which yeah. makes sense. I mean, I'm not it's new to creating. It must create. be time-consuming, though, surely. Hmm? That must be very time-consuming. What do you mean? Well, yeah, you know, just the, the cranking out a lot of words and refining and refining. Is that well, slow? I mean, it seems to me like a slow option. I might be... Well, well for me, slow. though, the revisions are very fast, and the cranking out of the initial words are very slow. And so once I have the words to play with, and I think as you write more stuff, like I've got six or seven or eight novels, um, you have a better, uh, you, you get better at the initial rough draft, at least at the yeah. micro things. At least your sentence structure gets bad. You lose a lot of the passive voice. You try not to repeat the same words 50 million times. And, and so you get better at the process. What I find I needed for is that I will drop myself subconsciously clues uh, to plotting in the middle of, of, of the book that I don't know are there until I go back and read. And I'm the kind of writer who will actually take a scene from the end of the book and shove it in the beginning or write three, three chapters in the beginning. And so my ori original beginning ends up on page 100. Um, so I would like it to be more efficient. On the other hand, I've written basically a book a year and run Geek Mom and wrote the Geek Mom book in nine years, so I'm thinking it's not too efficient, too inefficient. Mm -hmm. So I think it just, you know, it depends. I, I don't find that it takes me terribly long, but I mean, maybe I'm not explaining my process well. It's not like I'm um, not thinking about what I'm writing as I'm writing it. I'm just not worrying about the perfect word right now. I'm just. I can't out. not do that. Right. <laughs> Right, and that, and that's but I mean from everything I've read, you know, that's pretty typical that there's there's these you know different kinds of writers oh, yeah. fall mm -hmm. in different camps, and for me it helps to sit down and write a couple sentences about what it is I'm about to write. Like that has actually been very helpful to me to clarify my thoughts so that I don't just kind of wander off or, or let my characters wander off too much, and then just and then I go write it out, and I I'm. Um, I find that in my art, as well as in my writing, I, I'm the same sort of writer that I am as an artist, and that I work very fast when I'm working, but I need great chunks of time in between. Um, so therefore, I'm not as prolific as other artists who are who are always working, and maybe it takes them longer per piece. I create less, but when I sit down and write, the words come out great, and then I go back over. Uh, th that scene right after I've written it and I'll edit it in stages and then I'll come back a few days later or a month later and look at it and, and see what I think then so I wouldn't say it's um, it's not certainly not a pile of trash when I say a pile of words I'm being <laughs> cute you know what I mean <laughs> I'm being cute it's not like I just grab the dictionary and go these will do check them in the audience it's not like that 52 word pickup Right. <laughs> like Dorothy Parker said that that she's uh, all she has a it's on my wall over here. She says, I don't know why this is so difficult. All I have is a pile of paper covered with wrong words. And <laughs> I love that quote. But so no, I mean it's not like that, but it's just that I'm I'm not editing myself as I'm going. I'm I'm allowing myself to create a sketch. I try to think of it in artistic terms because that works for me. This is my sketch. Then I'm going to go in and add the grayscale and then I'm going to go in and add the color and then I'm going to go in and scrape out that bit because, you know, the perspective's all wrong. So, that's how I work. But anyhow, that's our pep talk. Uh, don't forget to go to everybody's websites. We're going to put the links up on the website so you can get the books easily because you've got to check out What's the name of your book again, Corinna? Uh, Phoenix Legacy. Phoenix Legacy and Hopeless Maine and your other the other book, Nimway? Spirituality Without Structure. Awesome. We'll put them up on the website and we'll see you guys next week. And don't forget to check us out next week. We're going to have Adam Blodgett who's doing the Chibi Tarot. He's, I'm calling him the Art Share Hat Trick because he's got um, <laughs> he's an artist and a writer and he had a successful Kickstarter campaign. He's an, an indie creative hero. So we'll mm -hmm. see you guys next week.